Okay. With the buildup of our compressible, linearized compressible um, potential equation and pressure coefficient that we obtained last time, today we're ready to finally apply this to airfoils by looking at corrections for compressibility. We're also going to look at flow behavior near Mach 1 later in this lecture. So we already have a theory for incompressible flow over thin airfoils at small angles of attack. So that's the thin airfoil theory. These are the same assumptions used to get our linearized perturbation potential last time. So this begs the question, do we really need to completely disregard all the results that we had when we're considering compressible flow? What we would like to be able to do is somehow correct the incompressible flow results for the compress compressibility effects. And it turns out that indeed this is possible to do. And we're going to discuss several such corrections. And the first correction for compressibility that we're going to talk about is probably the most famous, which is the Prandtl Glauert compressibility correction. Now, this is based on the linearized perturbation velocity potential equation that we obtained last time. And again, it's limited to thin airfoils at small angles of attack, which is no different than thin airfoil theory was. This is purely a subsonic theory, so that m infinity in general needs to be below about 0 0.7 for the results to be considered valid. So how do we get to this? So let's start by considering a subsonic compressible inviscid flow over an airfoil. So if we draw this airfoil existing in xy space where v infinity is in the x direction, this is consistent with what we developed last time, then the shape of the airfoil is defined by some function y equals f of x. The velocity at some point on the surface will have x component v infinity plus u hat and y component v hat. The angle between the surface and the free stream is theta, just like last time. So we have a thin airfoil and, and a small angle of attack um, so that the assumptions that u hat and v hat are small compared to, to v hat hold. So now we're going to define beta prime, sorry, beta squared, be equal to 1 minus m infinity squared. So with this definition, the linearized perturbation potential equation becomes beta squared times the second x derivative of the perturbation potential plus the second y derivative of the perturbation potential equals 0. So, so far, all we've done is in, employ a new definition. And now we need to invoke some level of mathematical abstraction to make some progress. So we're going to do a space transformation. So essentially we're going to redefine our spatial variables. C equals x and eta equals beta times y. 
So we've changed our spatial variables from x and y to c and eta. Now in the transform space, let's say we have a new potential. which is phi bar, which is a function of c and eta, and this is going to be equal to beta times phi hat of x and y. Now we can work out what the derivatives of this new potential uh, are going to look like by starting with using the definitions of the spatial transform um, and the chain rule to rewrite these derivatives of the phi hat potential. So in x, we could write this as the phi hat dc times dc dx. And to be fully general, this is also written in terms of the x. Now, looking at this definition, it's easy to see that the c dx is simply 1, and the eta dx is 0. We can do the same thing for the y derivative. And we'll get that the c dy is zero and the eta dy is beta. So this tells us that if we rewrite this now in simplified form, the phi hat dx is the same thing as the phi hat the eta, or the c, and the phi hat dy is beta the phi hat d eta. Now let's bring in our definition of our new potential. And we can say that the phi hat dx is 1 over beta. d e bar d c. And this is just using this definition. Somewhere away we can write that d c hat d y will just be equal to d c bar d eta. Then we can also get the second derivatives. d squared, d hat, dx squared is 1 over beta, d squared, d bar, d c squared, and d squared, d hat, d y squared is uh, beta, d squared, d bar, d eta squared. Now, we want to go ahead and put these definitions, which are now in terms of our new potential and the new coordinates, into the original equation, which was, again, beta squared, squared, d hat x squared plus d squared d hat d y squared equals zero. Putting these definitions, into this equation, what we get is beta squared 1 over beta d squared d bar d, d squared plus beta d squared d bar d eta squared equals 0. 
and you see this squared cancels with this. The betas are in both terms, so we can divide by beta. And what we're left with is simply this. Which is Laplace's equation. So we've gone, and just by doing a change of coordinates, we've gone from the linearized potential equation that we obtained last time to Laplace's equation, which has known solutions.